Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody to the college tonight. Don's going to be our moderator tonight. And before we get started, I just want to cover the format real quick of the uh, college rules. The college consists of three specific formats. First, we have a brief announcements period. Our speaker then speaks. We then have a question and answer period, followed by your rebuttals. Tonight, we have David Ramsey Steele. And I will now turn these proceedings over to Don to continue the festivities. <coughs> Get up board, Don. All right. Thanks, Tim. Um, all right. All right. My name's Don, and uh, uh, I'm the moderator at the College of Complexes. Tim, of course, is the he's normally the cameraman. Uh, he's he's uh, anyway. Uh, there are, uh, is our speaker ready? All right, it, all right, well, there being no more announcements, let's have a warm round of applause for our speaker tonight, David hey, Ramsey hey, Steele. Hey, 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 hey. Uh, uh, I'm sitting on, I'm sitting on, sitting on the bar. Every surface here. No, no, no. That, this flat surface here. You can set it over. You can set yeah. your key over there. Every surface here is slanted like Charlie's thoughts. Um, <laughs> all right. No personal attack. What? We gardener in your dargum. Okay. Good. So I have to be like this. Good. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe we can fix it so that we can hear it there. Let's try it. Let's try moving it up a little bit. Is that there? They, 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 you should be good there. We can hear you. Good? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Excellent. <clears throat> Fellow members of the proletariat and anybody else who may be paying attention, um, <laughs> this is really part two of my uh, talk on Marxism. Um, I gave the first part a few months ago and uh, I spoke about the labor theory of value and what's wrong with it and the materialist conception of history and what's wrong with it. And I said a little bit about Marx's conception of re revolution. Excuse what I'd like to do tonight is focus on the Marxist theory of revolution. Um, <clears throat> Karl Marx died in 1883. And at that point in history, his dedicated followers were quite a small number of people. But they were destined to grow in importance over the next couple of decades because in continental Europe socialist parties became more and more salient and these parties tended to be dominated by Marxist thinking. Um, so in Germany, in France, in Italy, in Austria, in Poland, in the Netherlands, in Russia, there was a growth of Marxist parties. And uh, this was a period where democratic rights were being extended in many countries. Uh, and these Marxist parties, or Marxist-led parties, I should say, uh, won a lot of votes in elections. So that by, let's say, 1912, they were a major force in the world. And these, this small number of intellectuals who had been around on the death of, the death of Marx in 1883 had become quite important people because there was a mass movement throughout Europe which was heavily influenced by uh, Marxism. <clears throat> These parties uh, were members of what we call the Second International. Um, the First International, the International Working Men's Association, had been founded by a group of people in the 1860s uh, and it had come to nothing. It had fallen apart. Um, so when the socialist parties of Europe formed a new international, it's usually referred to as the second international, um, the biggest of these parties was the German Social Democratic Party. And it grew very rapidly, became the biggest party in Germany. Uh, so all these continental European countries had a major socialist party in which Marxists predominated in most cases. I should explain in light of what was to happen later that no Marxist in 1883 or in 1900 thought there, w there should ever be a Marxist party. 
what they thought would be would be working class parties, which would be socialist because they were working class, and working class because they were socialist, in which Marxists would play a role, in which they would hope they would hope to play the major role. Uh, but the idea of you have to be a Marxist to join this party, that never crossed anybody's mind. Uh, and the degree of Marxist predominance in these different European socialist parties varied. It was very heavy in Germany, it was much less heavy in France, for example. There were many non-Marxist socialists. Um, <clears throat> but the influence of Marxism tended to grow over time. Now, what can we say about these, um, these uh, Marxist parties? Well, um, they were thoroughly and absolutely democratic. They were committed to the democratic process where democracy existed. They were very much against uh, violent minority insurrection. Um, and this is Marxism in the classic, the classic period of Marxism, uh, which is, say, from the 1890s until the First World War. Um, Marxism was a major force in the world, and it was utterly and totally devoted to democracy. Um, there were uh, people who wanted a violent insurrection in places like Russia, where there were, were no democratic rights, uh, but in countries like um, France, where there were elections, and even in Germany, where there was a sort of cramped um, electoral system in which property owners had more votes, basically, than uh, propertyless people, but there was, there was still some uh, democratic process. Uh, the Marxists were utterly, uh, utterly dedicated to uh, democracy. What is about England? You didn't mention... Well, I'm one fool at a time. You don't want to finish your speech, um, and then we'll have the Q&A. Russian and Marxists held the view that the most advanced industrial countries would be the countries in which socialism, uh, the socialist movement to overthrow capitalism, would be most uh, developed. Uh, and that was broadly true, because there were all these continental European countries where there were big socialist movements that were dominated by Marxism. Now, the English-speaking world was a bit different. In Britain and in New Zealand, uh, there was a, a big Labour Party. Well, the Labour Party didn't really get going until uh, the 1920s on a big scale. But there was a Labour movement which was not Marxist. Um, uh, it's often said of the, there's a cliche of the, of the British Labour Party that it owed more to Methodism than to Marx, and that's absolutely true. Um, and then, of course, the other big exception is the United States of America, where there was no big socialist party. Uh, this was a puzzle to Marxist theoreticians. In fact, one of them, uh, Zombart, his name was, Werner Zombart, uh, wrote a book called Why Is There No Socialism in the United States? Um, he was, a, he was a leading Marxist theoretician. He lived long enough to become a leading National Socialist theoretician in the 1930s. But anyway, um, th th this was a puzzle why there was no socialism uh, in the United States. But generally speaking, apart from the United States, there were socialist movements in all these major industrialized countries, uh, and mostly dominated by Marxism, although in Britain, uh, it was not dominated by Marxism. There were a few Marxists in the British Labour movement, but very few. Now, <clears throat> this was a big and powerful movement, um, and we should, when we look at this movement, we should forget what we think we know about Marxism because of the Bol Bolsheviks and the Russian Revolution, because this was, they, Bolshevism introduced all kinds of things which had never previously existed in Marxism. Uh, especially being hostile to democracy. Um, Engels, uh, who was Marx's close collaborator, died in 1895. Um, and, but there was a, a, a group of people in the German-speaking world who, who had known Marx and Engels, uh, were thoroughly acquainted with their thinking, and continued this traditional way of thinking. Uh, the, lead, the leader of the uh, theoretical German Marxist was a man called Karl Kautsky, and he was sometimes called the Pope of Marxism, which was an accurate analogy. He was indeed the leading theoretician, and everybody looked up to him. He wrote a number of books. He was quite clever, quite a, a, a brilliant mind, um, 
and uh, he continued to uh, propagate uh, the Marxist theory as it had been developed by Marx and Engels. Now these parties were sometimes called socialist and sometimes called social democratic, and it made little difference. That they, they, they had become um, synonymous terms at the time. Marx himself never called himself a socialist. He always called himself a communist and always referred to socialists as though they were his opponents. But what happened is around the time of the death of Marx, the Marxists decided to use the word socialism instead of the word communism. So this happened in the 1880s. <coughs> and, um, uh, and they would sometimes explain quite frankly, we used to call it communism, now we call it socialism. Why did they do that? Well, I think the main reason they did it was because there were these broad socialist movements and outside, outside, um, outside uh, Marxism, there was a general understanding that the collective term for these kinds of ideas was uh, socialism. So uh, they started calling themselves socialists. So the term communism just dropped out, wasn't used anymore for a while. And then it started being used in 1917 uh, in a different um, uh, sense. Um, a lot of people who are interested in Marxism, they decide they're going to find something out about it, and so they pick up the Communist Manifesto, since that's the most famous work of Marxism, and they're particularly struck by uh, the passage in the Communist Manifesto, which refers to the practical measures that will be undertaken by the um, Revolutionary Party that is trying to get power and what it will do when it has got power. Um, and it's unfortunate that people do this, because... Um, the Communist Manifesto went through many editions, and Marx and Engels wrote prefaces to many subsequent editions. And in all of these prefaces, they said, don't pay too much attention to this section dealing with the, um, with the immediate measures, because it's now out of date. So, uh, but that's the one thing that you, you find when you, people said, oh, I've read Marx, I've read the Communist Manifesto, and, they, and I can tell you they're in favor of it. Uh, steeply progressive income tax and things like this and it, that really is irrelevant because that was stated by Marx and Engels uh, to be out of date. Um, <clears throat> what happened within the Marxist movement was there was another pamphlet called Socialism, Utopian and Scientific. The English translation is called Socialism, Utopian and Scientific. Uh, and that replaced the Communist Manifesto as the main go-to summary of uh, Marxist uh, thinking on revolution. And it's worth reading, Socialism, Utopian and Scientific. It's actually sections from a book that Engels had written called anti during it came to be called anti during um, And, uh, but it's a, it's a general theoretical perspective on what it means to have a transition from capitalism to socialism, how it will be accomplished and how it will be done. And, um, and it, it's from that, from that pamphlet, Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, that we get phrases like the withering away of the state, because one of the things that Engels says there is that the victorious proletariat will seize power, or come to power through an election, both terms are synonymous in his way of thinking, um, they will then abolish private ownership of industry and bring all of industry under the control of the government, uh, under the ownership of the state. But then, promptly, the state will wither away and we won't have a state. So this is uh, um, a mystery, but this is uh, something in socialism, utopian and scientific that most people are familiar with. Now, <clears throat> what were the ideas of the <clears throat> uh, in socialism, utopian and scientific, and in Marxist thinking generally? I think we should focus on two ideas bearing upon the way, the shape uh, of revolution. I think there are two things we should focus on. Class struggle and the growing concentration of capital. These two things are supposed to work together to bring about the, the socialist revolution. Now, <clears throat> Marx and Engels held that Society was more and more splitting up into two great classes, the capitalists and the workers, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Um, and all other classes were disappearing, like peasants, domestic servants, and so on. They were dwindling. Uh, and so you would have this great class struggle 
between the owners of industry and the workers, the capitalists and the wage workers, people who are paid a wage. Um, and the condition of the workers would get worse. Now, there's lots of argument about this, um, because obviously the condition of the workers was getting better, visibly better, year by year. Uh, but various attempts were made to rescue the idea that the condition of the workers was getting worse, and one idea is that relatively that position was getting worse. Okay. Um, and there, were, there was this struggle between capitalists and workers, and the idea here is that the objective facts of real life are going to compel the workers to move in the direction of socialism. Uh, so that they are in pursuit of their interests, it's, that's going to lead them to conduct a socialist revolution. And then they will take power through the democratic process, if it exists. They will then bring all of industry into state ownership, but then the state will wither away and there won't be a state, uh, and we'll have socialism. Now, the other idea that, was, that is absolutely crucial is the idea that capitalist competition destroys itself by creating monopoly. And this is something which Marx was very clear about in Volume 1 of Capital. <coughs> One capitalist always kills many. So, big firms always beat smaller firms. So the average size of firms keeps getting bigger. Uh, each industry becomes monopolized, but then you get um, more than one industry being controlled by a huge uh, firm. So firms get bigger and bigger, not just absolutely, but also relatively, until the, ten the tendency is for the whole economy to be owned by one big firm. Now, Marx actually says this in one place. That's the, that's the, he doesn't think the tendency will ever materialize, but that's the tendency. So... <coughs> Um, this, this idea that um, capital is being concentrated in bigger and bigger organizations is, is tremendously important. Uh, and just to give one example, this is a quote from Socialism, Utopian and Scientific. Uh, one thing I should mention is, uh, at the time when Engels wrote this pamphlet, Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, in, in, um, in the 1890s, um, the tr what everybody was talking about who paid any attention to business and industry was the trusts. The, and the trusts were cart attempted cartels. And it, this is a big deal in the United States, it was a big deal in Germany, uh, where uh, all the big bosses of industry in a particular industry would get together and they would say, we're going to carve up this industry and we're going to say that you've got 10% of the... Uh, of, the, of the market now, you're going to keep 10%. And that's going to be your allotted amount, because we're not going to compete. We're just going to pretend to compete. Uh, and uh, in, so each industry is going to be carved up by these cartels, which are associations of the biggest producers. Um, and we'll fix prices so as to increase our profits, because we can do this because we're all acting together so if we're all acting together, we'll be like a monopoly. And if you're a monopoly, you can raise prices. That's the idea. So people were talking about this all the time in the 1880s and 1890s. It was a big deal. Trusts. Uh, and this is what Engels says. And Engels says this is the last stage of capitalism is the trusts. It gets more and bigger and bigger and more and more monopolized until you get trusts. Uh, and he says this. And I think this is a remarkable statement, but it's right there in in socialism, utopian and scientific. This is uh, Friedrich Engels. In the trusts, freedom of competition changes into its very opposite, into monopoly, and the production without any definite plan of capitalistic society capitulates to the production upon a definite plan of the invading socialistic society. Now, what he's saying there is Capitalism is being invaded by socialism. It's not just the people we want socialism, but by, because of the laws of development of capitalism, capitalism is being invaded by socialism. And it's being invaded by socialism because 
production is being organized on a bigger and bigger scale. There is more planning and less competition, and that is tantamount to socialism. So this is what Engels is saying there. I think it's absolutely remarkable. And of course, nothing like this actually happened. The trusts were just a f passing phase in the history of, uh, of business, and we don't have trusts anymore. Um, and uh, there's a very good reason why trusts uh, won't succeed and won't survive uh, in, a, in a competitive economy. But, um, <clears throat> but this was the idea they had. Um, so <clears throat> these, these two ideas, that uh, there is a class struggle and that organization is getting bigger and bigger, uh, those two things come together and they give you socialism, where there is one big organization controlling production in the whole world. Uh, and it's, un it's under the control of the victorious proletariat, who of course once they take control, they cease to be the proletariat because there is no proletariat and bourgeoisie anymore, there is just one class, and that is everybody, because everybody has the same liability to work, and there's no longer a division into classes. So this is the idea that, uh, that they have. Now, <clears throat> I'll just tell you why I think both of these ideas, the class struggle and the uh, in ever-increasing concentration of capital, they're both wrong. Um, I don't think there is a class struggle, or could ever be a class struggle, between capitalists and workers. Uh, and I'll explain why. Um, if you look at real struggles between economic interest groups that go on in the real world, you find always, on both sides of the struggle, there's an alliance of capitalists and workers. So what you have when you have interest group struggles in the real economy is one alliance of capitalists and workers fighting another alliance of capitalists and workers. And this is very easy to see. Um, <clears throat> a straightforward example would be protectionism. If a particular industry decides that they can get the government to pass import duties on foreign competition, people in that industry benefit, both capitalists and workers. If workers get higher wages, capitalists get more profits. Everybody else suffers because they have to pay more because they can't have these cheap imports. So there's a straightforward interest group str struggle there, but it's, between, it's not between capitalists and workers, it's between one alliance of capitalists and workers and another alliance of capitalists and workers. And I put it to you that that's always the case in all interest group struggles. It's never capitalists versus workers. It's always capitalists and workers versus capitalists and workers. They might say, what about strikes? Well, in strikes, there are workers who want to take the jobs of the people who refuse to work. So they're workers. So right there, you have capitalists and workers versus capitalists and workers. It's never capitalists versus workers. There's never been a class struggle. There never could be. It's impossible. It's inconceivable. So um, <clears throat> there is also the point that Marx's idea is that workers get, the working class, the proletariat, gets bigger and bigger and more and more united. Now that didn't happen because you've got the growth of the new middle class, the white collar workers. Now, according to Marx, the white collar workers are just as much workers as the blue collar workers. This is Marx's theory. However, Marx didn't just say they were just as much workers objectively. He also said they would become just as much workers subjectively. That is to say, they would think of themselves as having solidarity with the blue-collar workers. And that never happened. Never has happened anywhere. White-collar workers regard themselves as being a different kind of person to the blue-collar worker. And the blue-collar worker reciprocates. Uh, that feeling of solidarity between the office worker and the man on the factory floor has never occurred. Uh, in fact, they often come to blows. <laughs> Politically, I mean, and metaphorically, not literally. So, uh, so um, <clears throat> in every way, Marx's prediction of what would happen to class was wrong. Now, <clears throat> there has not been in capitalism uh, uh, a tendency for firms to get bigger and bigger. Um, trusts are temporary makeshifts. There are attempts at cartels. And the, it's fairly obvious why a cartel will not be able to survive unless he gets government help, of course. That then changes things. But if he doesn't get government help, 
Uh, <clears throat> circumstances are always changing. So you've got a firm, it's, let's say the cartel says that this firm should have 10% of the market. Now, something happens whereby this firm is able to produce a bit more cheaply. Uh, so they can get more customers and take customers away from other members of the car cartel. What's going to happen? Are they going to be well-behaved members of the cartel and say, oh no, we're going to stick to our allotted share of 10%? No. They're going to find ways round the cartel. And of course, the, the cartel's rules can't be enforced in court. Uh, they can only be enforced by gentlemen's agreements. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> the cartels always break down. They never, they never work in a competitive economy. They work if the government will introduce legislation to uh, bolster up the cartel. So, <clears throat> basically, um, these two ideas in Marxism of why there will be a socialist revolution are both false. Now, <clears throat> I would say this, if you look at, um, if you look at the Marxist movement in, in let's say, some, sometime around um, 1910, let's say, and you're a Marxist, you could be quite optimistic. You could say, well, our theory tells us that the working class is going to get bigger and bigger as a proportion of the population, and that they're going to become socialist, and that socialist parties are going to get more and more votes. Um, and that's been happening. So it all is ha seems to be happening on schedule. Um, but if you look more closely, if you were not quite so gullible, I think you would see in 1910 that... That's a misleading picture. And why is it a misleading picture? Well, the people who voted for the Social Democratic parties didn't want a social revolution. They wanted the government to give them old age pensions. They wanted the government to pass laws saying that trade unions would have a bit of a better deal. Um, that's the sort of thing they wanted. Um, they were quite happy to let the theoreticians of the Social Democratic parties blather on about the coming proletarian revolution and the abolition of capitalism, but they didn't want the abolition of capitalism. They wanted higher wages, better conditions, and what they thought would give them those things. So there is actually a different outlook between the masses, the rank and file of these parties, and the voters, people who are voting them in, and a tiny group of intellectuals who are the kind of theoretical, uh, uh, eloquent voice of these movements. They, they don't see eye to eye. And this, of course, the biggest... Uh, glaring example of this is the attitude to war. And this was all exposed in 1914. Actually, it was exposed in 1930. Uh, and actually, it was exposed to anybody who just looked around and used their eyes <laughs> much earlier. But um, there were all these socialist parties. There was a big socialist party in France. And the theoretical voices, the leaders, the intellectual leaders of that French socialist party said, we'll never fight for the French bourgeoisie against German workers because the German workers are our brothers. And the, the German socialist members, the, their theoretical intellectuals said, we'll never fight against the French workers on behalf of the German capitalists because the French workers are our brothers. Now, meanwhile, the great mass of members and voters of those socialist parties paid no attention to this whatsoever. They knew that they were Germans and therefore liable to kill French, or French and liable to kill Germans. And they didn't think the war was all about capitalism and finance. They thought it was about national glory and national pride. So, um, there were some people who actually deluded themselves right up until the last moment, thinking the war would be stopped by a refusal of workers to fire upon each other. And nothing like that remotely happened or was in the slightest prospect of happening. Um, the, work, the German workers were prepared to fight and kill and die in defense of Germany, and the French workers were prepared to fight and kill and die in defense of France. Um, and the, all that class struggle thing was just forgotten overnight. Um, <clears throat> and that this enraged Lenin. Uh, <laughs> as Lenin was uh, a Russian revolutionary in exile, and... Um, uh, he was so, so unrealistic in his thinking that it amazed him and he thought it was a lie when he first heard it. But when he found out it was true that the, uh, these, uh, the members of the socialist parties were all ready to support their own country against a foreign country, he was enraged and uh, denounced all the leaders of 
the socialist parties as renegades and, and traitors. But in fact, you know, what happened in Germany was there was a split and, uh, a, and uh, uh, a small group uh, broke away from the social, socialist party and formed what they called the Independent Socialist Party and they were opposed to the war and they included most of the leaders, the, uh, theoretical intellectual leaders of German social democracy, people like Kautsky, people like Bernstein, uh, they all joined this um, independent socialist party that was negligible in importance and was anti-war, whereas the great mass of the members stayed with the, uh, the social democrats, uh, the main party, and supported the war against France. Now, <coughs> those are a few things about the position of uh, of the socialist movement and the effect of Marxism. Um, I want to, I want to uh, make a couple of points about the feasibility of a, what Marx called a communist society, what these Marxists in the early 20th century called a socialist society. Because I maintain that the, the kind of society that they were thinking of couldn't exist. And there are various reasons for this, and I'm just going to go into two of them, and then I'll shut up and let you uh, uh, um, destroy me with your questions. Now, um, first of all, I'd like to mention, um, there was a man called Ludwig von Mises, who was Austrian, uh, and he, um, he was an economist. And he wrote an article in 1920, he published an article in 1920, saying that socialism was impossible. But this was a remarkable thing to say, because everybody in the world thought that socialism was coming. Even people who dreaded it believed it was coming. Uh, and so, uh, so Mises wrote this article. It's easily available, Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth. Uh, and he, uh, he says, socialism is impossible. It doesn't matter how much people want it, they're never going to get it. Um, and this seems a strange thing to say, but what he meant was this. We're defining socialism as a society in which output is at least as high as it is under capitalism. So it's not a poor society, it's a wealthy society. Uh, it's a society with advanced technology uh, and high output. And we're also defining socialism, because this is the way it was being defined by all the socialists in Europe at the time, as a system of society in which there are no markets in factors of production. There's no buying and selling of um, machine tools, buildings, uh, all kinds of industrial equipment. These things won't be bought and sold, they'll be planned without the financial system. And so what, what Mises was saying in 1920 was, the combination of those two things is impossible. You can't have an advanced industrial society without markets for factors of production. Now, what, what's his reasoning here? Well, let's, I'll, I'll rephrase what I just said slightly. What, what he's saying is this, the base, and a lot of people miss this and misunderstand what Mises was getting at. What he's saying is this, if you abolish markets in factors of production, there's going to be a reduction in output. There's not going to be an increase in output, there's going to be a reduction in output. Uh, and the reason he, he says this is because market prices convey valuable information. Because the fact that there is market exchange of all the factors of production, including labor, including capital equipment, including buildings, including uh, raw materials. The fact that there are, there are markets means that these things have a price, and the price reflects all the conditions throughout the market. And, it can, and if there's a change in conditions, it transmits itself through the system of information flow by a change in price, and people adjust. Uh, so that if one particular raw material becomes scarcer, the price rises, people uh, respond to this by using less of it and in economizing on it much more intensively and looking for substitutes and so on. Uh, and the market system works and helps industry to produce because of this information provided by market prices. So that is uh, Mises' argument. Uh, and my first book, which was published in 1992, um, <coughs> It's all about this whole issue, because what Mises said in 1920 led to a debate which went on throughout the 20s and 30s and 40s. 
uh, and my book, From Marx to Mises, which is now available as an e-book, um, is all about that debate. And basically, I argue that Mises was fundamentally right, made a few mistakes, but was fundamentally right. Uh, and I go through all the different attempts that have been made to offer a, a, a solution to the problem of socialist calculation and answer Mises, and I argue that they're all fundamentally mistaken, and that Mises is therefore basically correct, uh, with a few mistakes. So that's my view there. Now, <clears throat> if you read um, works by socialists and by Marxists, one thing I should say is this, that people don't, often don't understand this. Um, Marxism was a subset, or if you like, a sect, of a broader movement. Uh, and it's a certain kind of socialism that became dominant throughout the world through, among intellectuals in the 19th century. So, for example, you have, um, you have a book like uh, Looking Backward by Bellamy, who was an American and knew nothing about Marxism. But his conception of socialism is very much similar to uh, the Marxist conception. And Looking Backward was translated into German and so well to social de German social democrats. They didn't, they didn't say, this guy's not a Marxist, so we're not going to read this. They thought, oh yeah, he's on the same page as we are. Uh, so there's this broader socialist movement, uh, which I call, just because I'm pretentious, uh, and like to make up fancy names, I call neo-Sansimonianism. Uh, there is this broad socialist movement. So there are many people who are not Marxists who share the basic fundamental uh, outlook of Marxism in this period. <clears throat> so that's one thing you should bear in mind. Um, if you read, uh, generally speaking, Mar Marxists tended to discourage... Back off the mic just a little bit. Oh, okay. Is that better? Yes. Uh, generally speaking, Marx and Marxists tended to discourage too much speculation about the future society and what would happen in it. Um, Marx made various contemptuous remarks about this. Um, he said, um, I will not compose zu Kunstmusik, which is a reference to Wagner and shows the limitations of his musical tastes as well as uh, his, uh, the limitations of his uh, sociological imagination. Um, he says, uh, I refuse to compose recipes for future cookshops. Um, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> that's all very well, but uh, if things have developed to the point where you're saying that the cookshop is going to open tomorrow morning, then you better have a recipe ready. <laughs> so uh, what happened was, with the passage of time, various Marxists were under pressure to be a bit more explicit. And so some Marxists did write about what the future society would be like. The most famous uh, book uh, is called Woman and Socialism by August Babel. Uh, and it's, although it's ostensibly about the feminist question, it actually says quite a bit about how a socialist society will be organized. Um, and if you read what, what Marxists say about the, the political organization of the future society after the revolution, uh, two things, I think, strike you if you read a lot of this stuff. One is that they tend to think that a lot of things will not need to be decided because they'll just be obvious. Like, if we get rid of the market and get rid of the capitalists, then to, what to do will be obvious then. We won't need some complicated mechanism to achieve it because everybody will see what needs to be done and they'll all agree. So that's one thing. The other thing is there is a belief in something that was later to be called, they, the term didn't exist at the time, participatory democracy. You get this idea that, that, that people will participate in politics, the popular will uh, shall prevail in a socialist society. Now, in 1911, a man named Robert Michels wrote a book which in English is called Political Parties. And it's an absolutely fascinating book, and I recommend everybody to read it. Um, it came out, it was a, there's a very good American edition that was published in the 1960s, and it's in the Chicago Public Library System. Political Parties by Robert Michels. 
Um, what, what about Nicole? A lot of people don't quite get what he's saying. Uh, uh, and one version you will often hear is that Michels says that in an organization, the leadership of the organization, the bureaucracy, will turn against the members and will have contrary interests and will hoodwink the members and will go off and do its own thing. And now, Mich Michels did think that, <laughs> and he does assert that, but that's not his main point. His main point is simply this. Participatory democracy cannot exist. It's altered altogether and forever impossible. Uh, now, the term participatory democracy didn't exist in 1911. Uh, it ca came along much later, but it had already been refuted by Robert Michels. Uh, and basically, if you read it, it's very convincing. Uh, he shows how in an, you cannot have a large, complicated organization without a class of officials. Uh, and the interests of that class of officials is bound to be in various ways contrary to the issues of the broader membership. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, a, a few days ago, because I knew I was going to give this talk, I, dis I went to uh, Google partic participatory democracy and to see what it said. Uh, and um, it's quite comical, really, because it's a list. The history of participatory democracy is a list of people who have proposed it. It's not a list of actual examples, because there are none. <laughs> it's something that's never existed. Um, and incidentally, when I say this to people, and I sometimes convince them that there can never be such a thing as participatory democracy, they off their faces fall and they look downcast. I think it's a wonderful thing that there can never be participatory democracy because collective decision-making is hell. And it's one thing that humans should never be condemned to, is to be constantly involved in uh, making decisions about um, social matters. They should be left alone to lead their own lives and get on with what they really want to do. Um, so I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sad that participatory democracy is impossible, but however you respond to it, it is impossible. Um, now, finally, this leads me to this whole question of um, the withering away of the state. Um, If you, if you uh, read <clears throat> that some people are proposing that the government shall take ownership of all of industry and run the whole of industry as one great enterprise under one great plan, I think that most people today, the first thing that would spring to mind is that the people who are in charge of this uh, <clears throat> will be um, not very considerate of the wishes of the majority of the population. In other words, it will be a totalitarian system and quite brutal. And I think that that reaction is quite sound. Um, but the question, so the question is, why didn't the Marxists in the period of classic Marxism, from the death of Marx until the First World War, uh, why didn't they see that? Why did, why did they think? Uh, if, you, if you read their accounts of the future socialist society, it's a society of freedom, uh, where people do their own thing. Uh, and um, where um, everybody gets together and uh, they accomplish all kinds of wonders uh, without uh, oppressing or, uh, or delimiting anybody's rights. Um, and the, they laid out the reasons why they thought this, so we, we don't have to guess. Uh, their argument was that the only... Uh, uh, Specifically, you have to remember, they're predicting that government is going to take over the ownership of industry, and then there's going to be no government because the state will wither away. Uh, <clears throat> what they said was this. The only reason we need a state, which is a special force, to use, a special institution to use force to keep people in line, is because we have classes in society. Um, and like the, you know, you're the slave owner, the slave, the feudal lord, and the serf, and now we have the capitalist and the worker. These are separate classes. Um, and that's the only reason that we need the state. And so if we abolish classes, so the workers are going to take control, but then the capitalists are no longer going to own anything, so they're going to become just like the workers, so there's not going to be workers and capitalists anymore. Everybody's going to be the same. Uh, we obviously don't need the state. Um, <clears throat> I think the mistake in this line of reasoning is that 
There are many conflicts of interest in society which have nothing to do with class. Um, and I can think of some simple examples. I mean, if you... Uh, if there's a certain valley that could be flooded to provide cheap hydroelectricity from a dam, uh, then the people who live in that valley might object to this. So there you have um, a conflict of interest between the people who live in that valley and the consumers of electricity. Somehow that has to be resolved, and it's not clear that everybody's going to go along peacefully with a show of hands. Um, so. Uh, there are many examples like that, where there is conflicts of interest between people. Uh, and not everybody's going to be happy about the decision, whatever it is. So force is going to have to be used to make them toe the line. Um, and so my, my point here is not that we need a state. My point is that if we're going to go in for large-scale industrial planning, we need a state. Uh, if we're going to have central planning of industry, so that some body, it could be democratically elected, it doesn't really matter. Um, uh, some body is determining the whole of industrial st uh, structure and the whole of output. We are going to need a state to, that, that body is going to have to remain a state. In fact, of course, it's going to have to increase the powers. And this is, this is what happened in the Soviet Union. Now, the Soviet Union was not a Marxist revolution. It had nothing to do with it because it wasn't a majority democratic revolution. Uh, and the, the workers were not consulted and they were not, um, they had no control over what the Bolshevik dictatorship was doing. So, in that sense, it wasn't a Marxist revolution. But uh, they did find that if you're going to, when Stalin decided after 1929 that he was not going to go along with liberalization of the economy, uh, but it was going to impose central planning, it meant increasing the power of the state. Of course it had to. So, um, that's my final point, uh, that um, if you have central control, unified planning of the entire industry, uh, it's hopeless to expect the state to wither away. It's not going to wither away. You're going to have to increase the power of the state. Uh, and you, so, um, <coughs> The proposal to have a socialist organization of industry is inherently totalitarian. It's not totalitarian because the people who like it want it to be totalitarian. It's totalitarian because that's the inevitable result of what they're doing. Uh, it's an objective fact that it has to be totalitarian. Um, and therefore, you have to have a secret police. You have to have concentration camps. You have to have all the um, paraphernalia of the Soviet Union if you're going to have a socialist organization of industry. So that's, uh, that's my conclusion. Thank you. I know that, uh, well, first of all, I just, I just want to remind everybody again that all questions must end with a question mark. So, who has a question? Uh, uh, Andy, I'll start with you. I have basically a two-part question. Uh, Loud, one, please, Andy. What is, um, what, what was your, your, your general purpose of giving this speech? in the first place? What did you hope to accomplish with this group? And uh, what can, from your point of view, what can we do with the information you gave us to make life better in the United States and around the world? Well, how can we use it to make uh, life better for people? OK, um, so the question is, what's my general purpose in saying this, and how, how can we use the information to, to make life better? Um, my general purpose is to, because we constantly come across people who are hankering to have some kind of Marxist revolution. This is quite common. Uh, and they say that um, the Bolsheviks got it wrong in 1917, or Stalin got it wrong in 1929, or the communists got it wrong in China in 1949, or Fidel got it wrong in 1960. Um, but they, but Despite these unfortunate outcomes, uh, Chavez got it wrong more recently in Venezuela. Uh, despite this, there is still hope that we can have uh, an, 
um, a Marxist revolution uh, that will lead to uh, a good outcome. Uh, so basically I'm arguing that, that you, it's best to give up that hope because it can't be done uh, and there's something in the nature of the Marxist conception of the problem which is going to lead to failure and it's going to lead to uh, very unfortunate consequences. Now as to how we can use that to make life better, I would say if we rule out um, socialism in its um, old-fashioned sense, um, then uh, we've made a step, we've, we've narrowed the field of what uh, is possible and appetizing. All right, uh, Yolanda, did you have a question? Okay, very quick. Um, so, can you tell me more about Britain? Because I studied uh, in Russia history, but uh, here Britain. is like more free country and more opportunity to know more history. Can you tell me more about Britain during the Marxist time? How uh, Britain was, it was in England was a communist movement or socialist, or is it more capitalistic, uh, you know how to say, more capitalist level or uh, purpose to be more capitalist or 50-50 for socialism to take? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so the question is to say more about Britain. Um, what's interesting to me, and I've spent a lot of time reading about uh, the British labor movement, the British socialist movement, and um, what became of it. One of the things that strikes me, and, is, and I think I, I'm very, I find very interesting, is that um, the, the leaders of the British labor movement were not, very few of them were Marxists. And it was not an accident, it wasn't because they hadn't heard about Marxism. They'd heard about it and rejected it. Uh, and they had good reasons for rejecting it. So, so let's be clear about that. It wasn't just absent-mindedness. Um, but so um, the Labour Party uh, was the trade union party, and it was a, a committed to socialism in 1918. Um, and it had two minority governments in the 1920s, and then it had a, a, a big landslide victory in 1945 and became the majority government, and it's been in office several times since then. Um, and what it did in 1945 was it began a process of nationalizing industry, it nationalized a fifth of the British economy in a couple of years, uh, and introduced free national health service and uh, a greatly expanded welfare system and so on and so forth, and did some very good things like giving independence to India. Um, but <clears throat> um, the thing that strikes me, and it, I find it really, it's really sort of shocking, is that if you look at socialist intellectuals in Britain who supported the Labour Party in the 1920s and 1930s. They were not Marxists, the great majority of them. Uh, but their, uh, their definition of socialism, their conception of what socialism was, was absolutely identical to that of the German Social Democrats, who mostly were Marxists. Not only was their conception of socialist society identical, their, uh, their theory of how you get there, that is to say through the ballot box, through voting representatives into Parliament, and, and then taking over industry was identical. Um, so that's so uh, now <clears throat> that's an interest to me a very interesting fact. Um, I mean, basically, my view of what happened in Britain and various other countries after, let's say, the 1920s, was that without knowing it, socialists in politics faced a choice. They could either give up collectivism or give up democracy. They couldn't keep both. They didn't know this. <gasps> they didn't understand this. But that was the actual choice that faced them. Uh, and this worked itself out over many decades in a confused and muddled way. So that the social today we have socialist parties all, parties all over Europe that call themselves socialist. But of course, they're not socialist parties in the sense that would be recognized by people in the 20s and 30s because they want to preserve capitalism. And they're quite open about that. Um, uh, they certainly don't want to take away the ownership of industry from the private owners who, uh, who have, um, you know, trade in, sh in shares on the stock markets. They don't want to do that. Um, uh, usually there's a little minority that does want to do that. Um, but, um, and they make a little fuss now and then. But the great majority of these people don't want to do that. 
so what I, what I, you can sum up what happened, I think, to <clears throat> in this way, that at the beginning of the 20th century, there were a lot of people who were democratic collectivists. They wanted democracy, but they wanted collectivism. Uh, they had to make a choice. They didn't know it, and they still don't know it, but they did have to make a choice. Either you keep collectivism and you get rid of democracy, or you keep democracy and get rid of collectivism. Now, the people who, who kept collectivism and got rid of democracy were the communists, the Trotskyists, the Maoists, and all the people like that, who think like that. Um, uh, the people who got rid of collectivism and kept democracy were people like the Labour Party in Britain and the Social Democratic Party in Germany. Oh, all right. Um, let's see. Uh, Tim. I would like to know, in the late 60s, there was a proclivity towards socialistic policies, particularly under the general theory of employment and money, the 38, I believe, I think, written by... Um, 1936, John Maynard Keynes. Right. Yeah. And then, and that's... You know, between Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, there was a capitalist revolution. Can you describe what may have happened and your personal uh, theories behind why this happened? That would be about 20 PhD theses. Um, but I can say a few isolated things about it. First of all, Keynes was not a socialist. Mm -hmm. Keynes did, uh, Lord Keynes did not want to abolish capitalism. Um, uh, and he was hailed by many people for many years as the man who saved capitalism because he showed how to cure slumps. Uh, I think this is a mistake, but this is what people thought. Um, the, if you read people like George Orwell in the 1930s, who were dedicated socialist intellectuals, they were not interested in Keynes. Had no interest whatsoever. Keynes's book came out in 1936. Uh, and it made a stir among economists uh, and gradually won converts among economists and basically what Keynes said was that you avoid slumps by priming the pump, you know, if, 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 the, if, if aggregate demand falls then you, you do things to stimulate the economy. The whole idea of stimulus comes from Keynes or at least was given its rationale and its uh, popular, um, most popular version by Keynes. Um, so, th this is obviously not necessarily going to lead to socialism. Um, now, there were people in the Labour Party, a few people in the 30s, who did become Keynesians. And nobody would, nobody would have realized when these people were writing that they were the future of the Labour Party, but they were. Uh, there was a, a book published, I think, in 1936, the same year, maybe the following year, uh, Douglas J. The Socialist Case. And it's... It's basically arguing for a kind of gradual approach to socialism through Keynesianism. But, in, but when that book came out, it was not widely sold and not what, but, it, but that was to gradually become the ruling doctrine in the Labour Party. Uh, so in the Labour Party, you've, you've, had, you've had for ever since then this, uh, this idea that <coughs> Uh, well, the Labour Party had a thing called Clause 4 in its constitution, which committed the party to the common ownership of the means of production, distribution, and exchange. In other words, nationalizing all of industry, right? Um, the leader of the Labour Party in the 50s, Hugh Gateskill, tried to get that removed uh, and failed. Many years later, uh, what's his name? Um... No, the, uh, the, okay. it's such a non-entity, I can't remember his name. Are you but, talking oh. about Sir Keith Joseph? No, no, I'm talking about the Labour leader. Uh, 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 Tony Blair. Tony Blair. Okay. He, 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 got, he persuaded the party to drop that, so that has now been dropped. It's oh. not, the Labour Party on paper is no longer committed to, um, to uh, nationalising all of industry. <laughs> okay. Now, can you follow up? And are you familiar with the works of Sir Joseph yeah. Keith? Keith Joseph, yes. Keith Joseph and his pamphlet called The Humanity of Capitalism, perhaps, and its influence? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm familiar with that stuff. I mean, the, the real, uh, I think, the real dynamo here was Milton Friedman. Mm -hmm. oh. um, Milton Friedman um, 
uh, led a school of thought. I mean, Milton Friedman, there's two things here. Milton Friedman believed in the free market. He was a libertarian in his, in his uh, political philosophy. Uh, but apart from that, uh, um, he disagreed with the Keynesian consensus in macroeconomic policy. Uh, and he argued that money was much more important. See, the, 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 the consensus that emerged by the 60s, 50s and 60s, was that the government shouldn't pay any attention to the money supply because that would, was just like the small change. That was the dependent variable. Uh, and what the, what the government should do, uh, an orthodoxy had developed. What the government should do is, if things are a bit depressed, then you, you stimulate. And if things are too exuberant, then you clamp down, right? That, this is the idea. Uh, and what um, Friedman started developing a, a, what was really a return to an older theory, but with a lot more sophisticated uh, econometric techniques. The, the quantity theory of money, really, used to be called. Right. Um, basically, if, if you have inflation, it's because the government is increasing the money supply. Right? That's the reason. And of course, ultimately, now everybody agrees that Friedman was right about that. Uh, I mean, nobody thinks that if the, if the money, if the prices keep going up every year, the government and the government's printing a lot of money every year, that there's no connection. Right? Uh, one is causing the other. Right. So Friedman won that battle. And what happened in the 1970s was you had stagflation. You know, you had a combination of inflation and a kind of depression, uh, and that was contrary to the old neo-Keynesian consensus. So uh, Friedman's ideas. Um, were taken up by a lot of financial people and financial journalists, uh, academics in Britain. And, and uh, Sir Keith Joseph, who up until a certain point was not remarkably free market or anything, got hold of these ideas and thought they were great. And he started promoting. Then <clears throat> uh, I suppose he didn't have a very vibrant personality. So what happened was instead of him becoming prime minister, his follower, Margaret Thatcher, became prime minister. Yeah. She, she, she was a kind of... Um, Acolyte to right. Keith Joseph. Because didn't he used to speak okay, about eggs on his face? Jim, we need to get yeah, other people have a chance one. to ask okay. questions. Thanks. Right? So, um, so uh, sir, do you have a question? Yes. Um, you gave the, uh, the point that uh, uh, buildings and the means of production requires a market with prices, mm -hmm. according to a fellow named Mies. And could you speak a little bit to whether or not national health care, say as it's done in France or Cuba, uh, may be a real type of example of how that may or may not be working, given the idea that you need a market for the, uh, for, you need a price on something to do the best, uh, uh, method of advancement of, a, of, the, of the, the society in that area? Well, I mean, um, first of all, first there, of all, there, in national health care, there are no real prices. They're just codes. This was done, that was mm -hmm. done, they send it yeah, on. Yeah. There are no prices involved, but it seems to be working out in some places. Uh, how well it's working is another matter, but uh, I mean, uh, first of all, we have to be clear about this, that uh, there are all sorts of things that you can do as a piecemeal supplement to a market system that you cannot use to completely replace the market system. Now, I'm not saying whether they're good or bad, I'm just saying it's possible to do something that is not in itself a market system by taxing people and providing it. Uh, but what, uh, what Mises was looking at in 1920 was the whole the proposal to completely scrap the market system uh, and replace it with planning. And he said, this, is, this won't work, it's impossible, it's, pra it's practically unfeasible. Um, so that's really what he was saying. I mean, he, uh, he, Mises did have th his views. He was a free market person. He didn't like all kinds of government interventions. But th some of these interventions were, of course, are perfectly feasible. The question is whether they're actually worth it, whether, the, you know, that's a separate question. All right. Um, well, all right. Pat, do you have a question? Yes. Um, Karl Marx himself <coughs> envisioned his ideas taking root primarily in industrialized 
uh, <coughs> very well educated country. Right. So how do we explain the fact that one of the first countries, not necessarily the first, to latch on to this, or at least part of this, was the former Russian Empire, later to become the Soviet Union, where they kept 40 marks and they kept uh, blindly following what they saw as Marxist doctrine. How do you explain this when you had a country which was basically illiterate, very little industrialization, very little training of any kind, uh, we saw that during the First World War, when the Russian army behaved miserably uh, under combat conditions. Uh, how do you explain something like this? Well, I deliberately didn't get into the whole question of Bolshevism and the Russian Revolution because that's uh, um, I, the one. The one. The first point I would like to make is that um, the Bolshevik coup. Uh, in 1917, and it was a coup, uh, was not in any shape or form a Marxist revolution, even though the people who conducted it claimed that it was, uh, because it was not, you know, uh, Marx has a phrase, uh, uh, a movement of the immense majority, a self-conscious movement of the immense majority in the interest of the immense majority. Well, uh, the Bolshevik coup was not, was not uh, a movement of the uh, immense majority, uh, and the immense majority uh, had not voted for it. In fact, they voted against it. Um, and they were never to be given a chance to vote on it again until um, 1990. Um, so um, so it's, that, that is, doesn't follow the pattern that Marx uh, envisioned for uh, um, a socialist revolution. It also, it also contradicts, as you indicated, it contradicts the idea that you get in Marx that you expect socialism to come in the most advanced industrial countries. Um, you don't expect it to come in backward countries. Now, the thing about Russia was, it, Russia was a, a, big, a country with a big population compared with, say, Britain or Germany. Um, uh, and it, within Russia, there was a modern industrial society in 1917. I mean, Russia in 1913 was the fifth industrial power in the world. It, was, it had huge factories, huge industry, in it. but of course this was compatible because of the big Russian population with 80% of the Russians being illiterate peasants. The two things existed side by side. I mean, you could compare it with India today or maybe India, t India 20 years ago or China 20 years ago. You know, there was a, there was an in, a modern industrial se sector uh, that was very advanced, mainly owned and run by Germans, uh, German investors, some British investors, uh, some Russian investors, but not many. Uh, and um, so, so you have this combination. Now, um, it's, it is a phenomenon of intellectual history that very often a backward country, the intellectuals latch on to what is the latest thing in the advanced world, right? You know, in the, in the first world. The third world intellectuals latch on to the, what's going, what seems most exciting in the first world. So what seemed most exciting in the early 20th century was Marxism. So Russian intellectuals um, <clears throat> latched onto it. Now, initially, the <clears throat> there was a just like in the other countries of Europe, there was a, a there was a big political party called the Russian Social Democratic and Labour Party. That was the name of it. Um, <clears throat> in 1903, it split, and uh, on the letterhead, one group had Russian Social Democratic and Labour Party (parenthesis). Mensheviki, and the other one had Russian Social Democratic and Labour Party, in Russian of course, and then Bolsheviki, because on a particular committee vote, the Bolsheviks had um, a majority. So these two parties came into existence, both official names, the Russian Social Democratic and Labour Party. Both of these parties, uh, up until 1917, both of these parties said, you cannot jump ahead to socialism in a backward country like Russia. Both of them, both Bolsheviks and Mensheviks, up until 1917, took that line. And Marxism, uh, traditional Marxism, uh, uh, up until 1917, was quite unequivocal that uh, <clears throat> what you should do in that situation, a backward country like Russia, is you should demand a democratic republic and support the continuation of capitalism while trying to push for reforms that benefit the workers. That's 
that was the only thing. But then things changed. Uh, and when the, when the Bolsheviks seized, uh, because of the influence of Lenin and Trotsky, uh, and when the Bolsheviks seized power, their argument was, this is just temporary because there are going to be revolutions in the West, especially in Germany, and they're going to rescue us. That was their in initial argument. This is, we're just part of a world revolution. And so, although we're a backward country, we're just holding the line for a few months until the German revolution succeeds, and then they'll bail us out. And the critics of the Bolsheviks said, well, that's not going to happen, you know. <laughs> there isn't going to be a revolution in Germany. So the, the Bolsheviks said, okay, we're going to shoot you if you say that. And they did. And they shot all their critics. Um, now, um, of course, that never happened. Those Western revolutions never occurred, or they fizzled out, uh, let's say, to be, to be uh, charitable. Um, and <clears throat> uh, so then the, the Bolsheviks, having, uh, having fought a civil war, uh, and managed to win it and, and cement their power, they then had to decide what to do. What do we do now? They could hardly say, uh, we're going to go back to Marxism and support a democratic republic and allow the development of capitalism, because that would have been to say that what they've been doing since 1917 was all a big mistake. So they were locked into uh, justifying their existence as a so-called socialist uh, country. So um, it's a sad story. Uh, and it put back Russian development and world development by a hundred years. Um, but um, uh, there you are. Um, all right, uh, Dave. Uh, I, I threw up two questions. Um, Dave, Dave Zucker. Did you have a question? Yes, I did. Let's keep okay. the answer shorter, right? I realize that we got time, Charlie. On this and, and MSP increases. Okay, David Lauder, please. For the benefit of those of us who want short answers, um, what precisely made Trotskyism different from Stalinism? Where did Trotsky branch off from Stalin, and why was Stalin so anxious to get rid of him? Okay, somebody was saying I should make the answers shorter, so I'll try and be brief. Um, <laughs> the moderator is not doing anything. Uh, no, he's a very wise and intelligent and perceptive moderator. Um, uh, there was a power struggle. The, 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 the Bolshevik Party changed its name to the Communist Party in uh, around about 1920. And, um, and um, there was a power struggle. And... Uh, different people. You know, Stalin allied himself with certain people against certain other people. Um, and well, you all know the story because you've read Animal Farm and the story of the windmill that Trotsky was in favor of rapid industrialization. Stalin was against it, but then when he defeated Trotsky and driven him out of the country, Stalin became in favor of rapid industrialization. Right? That's the story of the windmill in Animal Farm. Um, so you can look at it in different ways. A cynical power struggle between power-hungry politicians, or you could say there were um, ideological issues, but they were um, uh, somewhat flexible, or you could just say that Stalin was a megalomaniac and uh, uh, you know, um, had, had problems, issues um, with control. <laughs> um, different ways of looking at it. I mean, I, I personally think that uh, things would not have been much better if Trotsky had won. Um, there, were, there was a kind of one, of the, one of the immediate reasons why Stalin was successful, I think, was that uh, Trotsky was seen Trotsky was seen as the big danger. You see, what goes wrong in a revolution? The military leader, the flashy person, personality, like Napoleon, then takes over and becomes the despot. And so if you, were, if you were a Bolshevik and you were looking at these people, you think, oh, the big danger is Trotsky, right? He's flashy. He was, he was a general in the Civil War, what basically won the Civil War for the Bolsheviks against the whites. Um, and uh, he's very full of himself and always giving flowery speeches, whereas Stalin's this blunt, no-nonsense kind of person. So that, I think, swayed, um, uh, right. swayed a lot of people in the Communist Party. Um, all right. Who else has a question? Oh, Dave Zimmer, go ahead. Uh, I, I read part. I read um, Marx's uh, work, Das Kapital, and I was very surprised at the idealistic sections, which I I couldn't believe what somebody would write. Uh, you know, one one day we'll we'll work in the factory, and the next day we'll go for a walk, and the third day we'll have a picnic. 
It uh, seems like it's just lifted right out of the Judeo-Christian <coughs> vision of the future messianic age. Right. And uh, don't Marxists read that? And aren't they uh, astonished by it? That Actually, that quotation isn't from Capital. That's from an earlier work. Uh, and I think a lot of Marxists would say it's a bit utopian. I mean, uh, to be to be fair to them, that you know that's the sort of. But yeah, that's the bit where he says society does this and society does that. And I always think, oh, it's great of society to do all this. I wonder who that is. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's all right. it. Okay. Um, all right, uh, Bill, go ahead. Yeah. How obvious can things on the bottom of the economy be to a central planner? I'm not sure what the question is. How obvious well, can things... Okay, go ahead. What was your question again? How obvious can things on the bottom of the economy, the grassroots, be to a central planner? Okay, how obvious... Well, I think, that, I think the people at the top of the system are going to tend to overlook a lot that goes on at the bottom. I, I find that even working in a private business, that the people at the top sometimes don't have any idea what's going on at the, at the bottom, which means me. Um, uh, so uh, if you're talking about a whole economy, and much less the world economy, I can just imagine the sort of things they would overlook. All right. Um, uh, Brian, you had your hand up for a yeah. while. Go ahead. Uh, I, I understand that there are divisions in the working class, and there are also divisions in the capitalist class. Uh, but overall, if you're going to base your program on the interests of a capitalist class or a working class, uh, the working class is interested in changing things so that the capitalist class is not uh, going to uh, rule. Is that not so? Well, you're presupposing that the capitalist class does rule, and I wouldn't accept that. I would say that um, uh, in this country, you have a ruling class, meaning that a tiny group of people make all the decisions. But they're not the heads of industry. You know, they're, they're people in Washington think tanks, and they're lawyers and Ivy League professors um, uh, who, who are, who are uh, the ruling class in this country. Oh, a lot of them are, are intellectuals, yes. Um, I'm not saying they're high-powered intellectuals. They're not intellectuals I have a lot of respect for, but they're, but they're you know, it's, it, they're policy wonks and, uh, and people like that, people who, people who um, in think tanks in Washington. They're the people who, who uh, provide the, the uh, personnel for the ruling class. There's no, I don't think there's a social class like the capitalists, like big business or something like that. I mean, if you look at, if you look at people in ruling circles, the thing that, strike, that strikes anyone is the huge preponderance of lawyers, actually. Um, they seem to be, have a big toe in the, in the ruling class. Uh, but anyway, going, one thing that I should mention about this whole business of the class struggle is that most people are workers and capitalists. Most people have some savings on which they get uh, even if it's just for retirement, they get some income. Uh, and um, this is important because the, the Marxists, in, in round about the time of the death of Marx, and uh, uh, well up to the First World War, they took the view that this was going to be eliminated, that all savings of workers would disappear, that they'd basically, that's the whole idea of a proletariat, you don't have any savings. Um, well, that hasn't happened, and, uh, and um, there was a man called Eduard Bernstein who was founded something called Revisionism. He was, he was in the um, German Social Democratic Party, and he was a, had been a friend of Marx and Engels. So there was no more impeccable uh, background for a Marxist than Bernstein. Uh, and he, um, he pointed out that the capitalism was not developing the way that Marx and Engels had expected it to. And one of the ways, one of the many ways, was that... The, the economic profile was not just splitting up into two camps with a super rich and a proletariat who own nothing. Instead, the, the, the non-capitalists, so to speak, the people who work for a living, uh, have sold, uh, that sold their labor for a wage or salary, they were getting more and more savings, and they were owning their own houses, for example, um, and uh, you know, and they were having, and they were, and they were looking forward to retirement, which a couple of hundred years earlier, no, but no working person ever did. They didn't retire; they just worked until they dropped. So, um, yeah, yeah. 
what, what he was asking about. At this stage where the working classes are, are, are becoming more prosperous, and saving money, owning homes, in what country is this happening, or countries, and at what time, what type period of history was this happening? Well, it was, uh, it was pointed out by Bernstein in, in the 1890s, uh, in oh. evolution, his book that in English is called Evolutionary Socialism. Uh -huh. uh, he observed that, and, oh. um, you know, um, uh, the rate of home, home ownership in most Western countries has gone up over a long period of time, uh -huh. uh, since the 1890s. Okay. All right. Um, uh, all right, let's see. Now, um, Charlie had his hand up for a while. What, what was for your about question, three Charlie? years. <laughs> okay, okay. I think I was about to make the revolution. Yeah, waiting for the revolution here. Uh, all right, you told us there's a possibility of a revolution, sir. And I see it all the time. When I came down there, I read about various strikes that were taking place. I see there's a socialist candidate that's quite popular. Um, there's all sorts of social change that takes place in our society, various degrees, and there's no stasis. If anything, the figures just came out that the disparity between the rich and the poor is the greatest it's ever been in the history of this country. Right. And you seem to think, and just judging by the presence of that on the internet, I don't know what's going to happen by that, but a lot of people took an interest in that. And you just can say, well, they don't mind being cheated out of money. Who do you think is being cheated out of money? Well, <laughs> Donald Trump says, I'm, I'm paying for my own campaign. <laughs> then he talks about hiring thousands of people. They're the ones paying for his campaign. I get cheated every paycheck. What are you talking about? Uh, by the uh, you think you should be paid more? By the CEO who keeps the money for himself. You didn't know that? You think you should be paid more? Huh? You think you should be paid more? Well, yeah. That's, yeah. 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 It's, all right. Uh, uh, all right. Do, you want me, do you want me to answer that? Yes. Uh, so do you, do you, are you paid more or less than your marginal product? That's what I want to know. What? Uh, <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's move on. We got a lot of people with questions, uh, sir. You, in the back, you had your hand up. Is, for a while. is there is there any uh, connection, be, uh, any Marxism woven into um, uh, communes? You know, we have a lot of communes in America. So I wonder how the evolution of that has happened. Is there Marxism as a philosophy to start those communes? Well, um, if we're looking at, if we're pinning down what Marx himself thought, generally speaking, Marx was quite favorable towards all kinds of experiments like that. And he occasionally wrote letters in which he said, uh, you know, this is not social, this is not communism, but it's a good thing. But for instance, producers' cooperatives, workers running the factory and owning the factory and running it themselves. Uh, it's not, that's not going to lead to the revolution, but it's a good thing that people are trying that sort of thing. So, but, Je but it wasn't his main line of, of um, what he was expecting. What he was expecting was the majority of the people will become poorer and poorer, better and better organized, more and more unified. They will get together uh, and vote out because he believed in democracy once you had it. Um, uh, the, the current people who are representing the capitalist class, and then they'll take over and they'll reorganize society from the top. So, so, uh, so communes have, have, the, they have the wrong idea, communes have the wrong idea because as you and uh, Sid have alluded to, or have said, you guys need good capitalism to springboard into socialism. So, so these right. communes are just starting with zero. They're not starting from capitalism, they're just starting from basic socialism. And that can't work in a commune. Is that true? No, I'm asking. I'm trying to figure out these communes. Well, are they doing the right thing? Wrong? Well, I mean, uh, you, you know, know I, it's not quite clear whether you're asking me what I think or what Mar what this has got to do with Marxism. They're two different things. I'm not a Marxist. I'm a Marxologist, but I'm not a Marxist. Marxism, Marxism. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, generally speaking, I think the, there's all kinds of Marxists now. There are thousands of different sects of Marxism. Uh, and I don't want to speak for all of them, all right. but but uh, but uh, but uh, they, generally speaking, would not be opposed to things like communes. But they wouldn't think that was the route to um, getting a socialist revolution. Okay, Bob Lichtenberg, you had your hand up. Do you have a question? <coughs> yes, uh, 
Do you consider Marx to be an economic determinist? He, he thought that the economy shapes our entire lives. Uh, what we do with money? Uh, that's an interesting question. Marx, I, I think it would be an oversimplification, a crude oversimplification, to say that Marx was an economic determinist. Uh, I don't, I, he, he called him, he, 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 he said that he took, he took a, a, a materialist approach to history. Um, and the, the, when in the talk I gave, the first part of this that I gave a few months ago, I did actually discuss the materialist conception of history and what it might mean. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, Excuse me, I wasn't at that talk. What, what do you, when you say materialist conception of history, what do you mean by that? Well, Marx had a, a distinctive view of history, but he didn't write at length explicitly about it. There's just a few little passing remarks and one, pa and one passage about half a page where he, he describes it. And what he says there is that um, there, are the, there are forces of production, which roughly speaking means technology. There are relations of production, which is the way people, the fundamental way that people organize themselves, especially things like property law. And he argues that the forces of production develop because there's technological innovation. They come into conflict with the existing relations of production, and then uh, tension is created and it has to be resolved, and it's resolved by bringing the relations of production into harmony with the forces of production. So that's, that's, that's what Marx says, about, and of course, doesn't mean much in isolation, but that's what Marx says uh, is, his, is his historical materialist view of, of uh, social change. All right. Now, is there anybody else who has a question who has not already asked a question? Yes, you, sir. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Marx and Engels had to rewrite the manifesto in 1880. How different would it be? Well, I mean, we do, we do know in a way because we have Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, which was a pamphlet that Engels wrote and which did become a substitute for the Communist Manifesto. It was a, a sort of updating of a lot of the stuff in the Communist Manifesto. Um, and you can read there, uh, I mean, there's much more emphasis on concentration of capital and all this talk about the trusts. Um, there's, um, you know, the... the, the there's much more talk, of course, about this being imminent. There's much, it's much more democratic in flavor because when um, the Communist Manifesto was written in 1848, written in 1847, published in 1848, uh, most of Europe didn't have democracy. So they were thinking in terms of violent revolution at that point. Uh, so, so there are all those differences that I've alluded to. You know. All right, sir, did you have a question? Are you planning part three on the evolution of fascism? From the, the evolution. Of, I could talk about fascism, actually. I've I mean, done a bit of work day. on fascism. Uh, but um, now my ne my next gig here is uh, on Karl Popper. Um, uh, so that's that's my plan. Whether I will get to fascism eventually, I'm not sure. Um, all right. Now, is there anybody else who has a question who has not already asked a question? Okay. I have uh, one. Uh, I had one question that, that I wanted to, uh, uh, to ask you about, and what I wanted to ask you about was Germany, uh, Germany today. Mm -hmm. Now, um, are you, Mr. Steele, are you familiar with, um, are you familiar with the German, with the German economic system of today, how, uh, how the Federal Republic of Germany? How it would be an exaggeration to say I'm familiar with it. I oh, know a little okay. bit about it. Okay. Well, yeah. okay. well do, you, are you, do you know what? Do you know what the Do you know what the German worker councils are? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Would you like to explain to um, Would you like to explain to the uh, to to everyone? Now, and also, do you know what uh, Do you know what the co Do you know what a co-determined board is? Well, where where workers elect some of the board, right? Um. All right. A co-determined board of directors. Every corporation headquartered in Germany that is above a certain size that, that has um, uh, one half of all members of the that. board of directors are, are appointed by, uh, are appointed by the, uh, they're elected by the employees themselves instead of, uh, instead of representing the stockholders. That's, that's what a co-determined board of directors is. And so I wanted to ask you, um, and you know what worker count, what the German worker councils mm -hmm. are. So I wanted to ask you, what do you think about all that? Well, um, 
What do I think about it? I mean, uh, I th first of all, I, I'm, I'm in favor of the organization of businesses being open to freedom of contract. So I'd, I'm not in favor of the government imposing some kind of pattern on the way that businesses are, are, are run. Uh, so um, if, if people wanted to um, have the employees voting uh, onto the board, that's fine. But uh, the government imposing that, which is what happens in Germany, I'd be opposed to that, just like I'd be opposed to lots of other um, restrictions on the way that you organize management. So the employees should just do what they're told? Well... <laughs> Uh, employees do what they're told in return for a wage. Well, that's, the, me, that's, the, that's the maybe that's the that's the deal. Maybe I need to be a little more specific. Would you consider the German model a form of socialism? Oh no, no, it's a form of capitalism. Oh, okay. Uh, now uh, I'll tell you what. Let's have one more question. Oh shoot, we got we got Pat and Charlie, Tim. Could we, could we get questions from both Pat and Charlie and then move on? That's to fine, as long sound? as we can keep it within five minutes. It's 8.01 okay, now. Okay, let's just keep it brief. Okay, All you, right. you first, Pat, and then Charlie. Uh, real quick question. If Karl Marx were to come back today and take a look at the things that are being done in his name, uh, the people that are quoting him or things that he supposedly said, what would his reaction be to people today who call themselves Marxists? Uh, outrage, um, uh, disbelief, um, uh, you know, what is this nightmare? Um, that would be his reaction, I think. Mm. Okay. Um, Charlie, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, towards the end of your talk, David, I seem to got the impression that you determined that anything that is operated by the government to be totalitarian, meaning things like public transit, that I took to get here is a totalitarian transportation operation. Uh, other aspects of our things such as the education system or care for senior citizens through Social Security, I guess you regard as totalitarian as well. Or is that just libertarian rhetoric? Um. All government is totalitarian. I didn't say that all government was totalitarian. Obviously, that's not true. Do you learn a lot? <coughs> I mean, I don't think the U.S. government is totalitarian. I think the North Korean government is totalitarian. I think the, I think the Soviet Union up until 1990 was totalitarian. How do you regard government operations in general? Uh, they don't seem to work very well. <laughs> yeah, they are. But, but, I mean, there's, look, there's the different th things going on here, Charlie. Don't work. Tell Charlie, me there, don't Charlie work. You've, got, you've got to understand there are different, it's complicated, the world is complicated. Um, totalitarianism, uh, what I was saying was not that anything government operated is totalitarian. I didn't say that, and I don't think that. Uh, what I do think is this. Uh, I agree with what Friedrich Hayek said in The Road to Serfdom, 1944, uh, where he said that if you adopt the the proposal to run the entire economy as one planned organization, it's going to lead you to totalitarianism. Uh, I think that's, uh, each step you take will make, you'll have to use more coercion uh, and uh, until you have a totalitarian system. So, uh, um, so that's what I think. And I think that um, the, the whole, Mar the Mar Marxist, Marx didn't believe this at all. Marx thought that you could have a collectivized economy, but everybody would be free. And he meant, to, he believed they would be free, free in every sense. And I think that's, a, that's impossible. I think that if you have a collectivized economy, it's going to lead to people being unfree. Um, all right, all right, let's, uh, that's going to have to be it, folks, for the questions. Okay. So let's have, a, let's have a, a round of applause for our speaker. <laughs> We'll, uh, you'll, you'll get to have the last word, though, so you might want to stick around and listen to the rebuttals. All right. Now, first of all, I want a show of hands, y'all. Uh, how, many, how many people wish to give a rebuttal speech? Everybody who wants to give a rebuttal speech, raise your hand. Keep them up. Keep them up, folks. One. Okay, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, I count eight people uh, according to... Um, all right, that that would be um, four minutes. No, 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 no. Yeah, twenty minutes each. 
Uh, it's act minutes, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Um, uh, no, no. Uh, I gotta say five minutes each. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I have a little cheat table down here. Okay, five minutes each, everybody. All right, I got a clock. Can well, everybody eight see eight the clock? Five is forty, and then there's me. So yeah, we'll, we'll make it. Can everybody we'll see the it. clock? But it's gotta gotta be five, gotta be five minutes. Andy. Each. I'm gonna be keeping. Okay. No more. You I start it. the clock. Yep. Okay. Um, that includes you too, by the way, Andy. Yeah, I'm going to uh, keep it very close within a second or two. Um, don't know where to begin. There's a, a famous movie uh, with Michael Douglas called The American President. In that, he gave a little talk where he, he called out a senator that looked very much like Dick Cheney, and he said, we have serious problems that require serious people, and your 15 minutes of fame are up. Um, our speaker tonight has very uh, brilliantly described the problems that society has when when people are uh, bogged down in economic or social theory without uh, acknowledging that they're standing in a blizzard of crisis and claim they can't see a single snowflake. We have major, major crises in the world today that, uh, if they're not addressed, uh, academic discussions of uh, Marx and Russell and a whole bunch of others of 100 years ago is not going to make any difference to anybody. Mm -hmm. right? right? I have two flyers here that were given out to students on Veterans Day at uh, Riverside Brookfield. So we have veterans are invited in to uh, talk to uh, students before they get uh, exposed to recruiters. For those of you that don't know, uh, my brother and I run a, a service where we translate enormous amounts of evidence into small uh, briefing papers that can be understood by people with ordinary language skills. That comes from my physics teacher in high school. He'd, we'd be looking at something incomprehensible. He'd call on one of us, we're looking at the physics textbook, and he'd say, ah, Miss Wilson, can you translate that for us into language that can be understood by the average gum-chewing American? What does this mean to your average gum-chewing American? I would hope that our speaker from tonight would schedule a, a night sometime to translate a lot of this stuff into simple sentences that can be understood by gum-chewing Americans like myself that don't have a PhD in sociology, economics, and all the other scientists. I, I work with, as near as I can tell, real-world examples of problems and solutions. I coach seventh graders. We teach them in order to solve any problem, you have to first correctly identify the problem then correctly identify the solution. We, our, our society today, uh, for those of you that want one of these yellow flyers, it's called the Trillion Dollar Golden Triangle. The United States is running the greatest welfare for billionaires program in the history of the human race. We are sho shoveling more money to billionaires in the shortest amount of time. Nothing has been seen like this since the pharaohs walked the earth. Twenty billionaires own half more, more wealth than half uh, the bottom half of the United States. That just made the news. The gap, uh, and of course, you're, we're, we have failed to come to grips with the concept that we're dealing with billionaire predators. Billionaire predators own and operate our Congress, the media, the military industrial complex, the whole ball of wax. And uh, the, since they control the media, uh, Americans are living in a bubble of media generated mythology. Here's the, the three biggest ones. The three most radioactive subjects right now are, number one, the myth that our sons and daughters are fighting for freedom and justice in foreign lands. It's a total myth. Myth number two is the myth that we were attacked by 19 crazed Muslims on 9-11. That's a total myth. Seven buildings were demolished in a real estate fraud, and the media who was in on it sold it as a terrorist attack so that the owner of the, uh, the whole complex would not be sued for spreading asbestos dust all over lower Manhattan. That's forensic evidence published in tens of thousands of places all over the world. Not debatable. The third myth, of course, some of you may have seen Charlie Sheen's face in the newspaper lately. Charlie Sheen is being used as a poster child for phase two of the so-called AIDS epidemic. 
phase one was convincing us that a whole bunch of sick people were sick because they had a harmless retrovirus known to be harmless called HIV. Phase two now is convincing people that they should take one pill a day for the rest of their life to stay safe even though they're not HIV positive yet. So phase two, one pill a day, the Obamacare will pay for it, costs thirteen fifty a month. So we're looking at uh, people that are making billions and billions of dollars the, in the medical industrial complex, the military industrial complex, the media industrial complex. So uh, there's s solutions everywhere. Anybody wants some more information or any of these flyers, see me uh, later. Thank you. Next, Sid, clock's right here when you're ready. Essentially, I found the speech to be a rationale of capitalism. For one thing, he says there's no class struggle. It's all you have to do is read the newspapers or look at the television. You see all these workers going out on strike constantly. As far as Walmart is concerned, as far as these hamburger places are concerned, all these places that employ people for eight or ten dollars an hour, they can't live on it. And the millionaires and the billionaires are becoming richer and richer constantly. The latest statistic is 854 people own half the wealth of the planet. If that isn't concentration of wealth, I don't know what is. As far as them working to make that money, that's impossible. No change. But they got other people working for them, and they exploit them, and make all this tremendous profit. <laughs> That's where the profit comes from, is from work. And a lot of these people never work the day of their lives. That's all they do is sit and cut coupons and get interest. They're rentiers is what they are. They make money, make money off of being a parasite. So you have a class struggle. That's one thing. Another thing, he didn't mention anything about imperialism. The United States is the most imperialist country that ever existed. It's the modern day Rome. We have something like um, 800 bases around the world. We also have puppets in every country almost in the world that, don't, that support us. And they uh, support us because they're also imperialists, but they're junior imperialists. They're not senior imperialists, like the United States. And if you look at the history of the United States from 1898, when the Spanish-American War existed till now, the United States has invaded or has used uh, other people for that invasion in a hundred different countries in the 20th century. We have planes and ships going around the world constantly, supporting all these dictatorships. Egypt, you had all of Latin America, Haiti, Cuba, Dominican Republic, uh, Guatemala, uh, uh, Argentina, Brazil, all these countries at one time had dictators that was supported and put into place mostly by the United States. So we're an imperialist country. Of course, the average person doesn't get much out of it, but they, what they did is they used imperialism to a certain degree to uh, have a middle class in the United States. What they've done is they, they bribed some of the working class in the United States so during the, after, after the war and during the Roosevelt period, they're able to have a decent living. But now, as the empire is falling apart, you see people getting poorer and poorer and poorer. And people don't even have enough uh, money to live on. And that's why they go out on these strikes. They're constantly going on strikes because they can't make a living wage. So if, if that isn't class exploitation, I don't know what is. Uh, he talks about the office workers as being separate from the, from the uh, workers in the factories. But if you go into an office nowadays, they've been proletarianized. You see in these little 
cubicles working, they've been proletarianized. Yep. And a lot of them don't, don't make too much money. They're more or less the workers like they were in the factory. So the whole thing was the rationalization of capitalism. Well, I'm going to be a bit eclectic. I sort of is usually, but there's an economy in which everything is obvious enough for central planning. I spoke about it uh, several weeks ago in that session on emotional intelligence. But the human emotional and psychological makeup evolved in a food gathering, hunter gatherer band. And these bands, uh, there's a book, came out in 1978 uh, on uh, uh, called People of the Lake, Richard Lewin and Roger Leakey. People of the Lake. Man, origins of mankind. But for the food gathering economy to work, it has to have both aggressive emotions and uh, sympathetic emotions. Aggressive emotions to deal with cheaters and sympathetic emotions to drive members of the band to each other's uh, assistance. And I, I, I see well, just almost every political movement is somehow an expression of this primitive, primitive unity. Uh, as far as the other, if you look at Phil Llewellyn's Llewellyn Ruffles website, <coughs> you can find an essay by Murray Rothbard on his differences with Milton Friedman. And that's largely a central bank and an income tax. Uh, he doesn't believe in either, but Friedman believed in a uh, uh, steady rate of uh, in, you know, monetary expansion. Uh, and Rothbard said the numbers keep changing. And uh, the belief, the Friedman believed in a reverse income tax, which applies a positive income tax too. And I think uh, that's the difference between a real free market and a phony one that some people around here seem to believe in, which I think deserves all the criticism it gets. Now, a genuine free market, if you want to understand what happened to redistribution of wealth under a genuine free market, you look up. Uh, John Maynard Keynes, Economic Consequences of the War, about page 233 or 234. Uh, he describes very elegantly how uh, the redistribution of wealth becomes the distribution of wealth. And that's exactly what I'm against. It's a very hard concept to get over. It, do, uh, it doesn't fall into conjunction with your primitive uh, hunter together or band uh, mentality. Well, I guess I can leave it at that. All right, all right. All right, all right. No redistribution of wealth, that's what you said? Yeah, no redistribution of wealth. All right, you're going to make a lot of single mothers pissed off, brother, just so you know that. I did taxes last year. I'm going to tell you all something. I'm already started. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of single mothers with uh, kids. I did taxes for the uh, poor folks and the ARP folks. A lot of, a lot of mothers get between anywhere $3,000 to $6,000 in redistribution of wealth. I'm not saying good or bad. I'm just letting you know the facts. But anyway. Uh, a couple things, you guys talk about the marketplace, and uh, first thing I want to say is uh, I, I agree with David, and um, <coughs> and, and also uh, uh, capitalism has a very big heart. It has such a big heart, Sid. We want you to start socialism in America, but but you don't have to start it with, with the whole country. 
You can start it by doing uh, buying your own apartment building and, and having everybody live there, give your paychecks once a week, pay the rent, buy the food, everybody gets a bottle of vodka, slippers, and a loaf of bread. You guys can do it. Don't be listening to this rhetoric all around you, brother. Do it. America has a big heart. They want you to be happy in America and do your own thing. No one's stopping you, brother. No one's stopping you. And I hope you succeed. It's a beautiful thing. And the reason it's a beautiful thing is because a lot of social ills uh, you, that you hear about can be eliminated by having socialism uh, take, take, take effect. Let me give you the example. Everybody's mentioned about the marketplace the, uh, the, the, and the wealthy. Here's one guy who mentioned about the wealthy all the time. Here, here's, here's what happens. <clears throat> the marketplace is not forcing you to take that $16 an hour job, is it? Has anybody ever forced you to take a $16 an hour job? Yeah. What are the options? Yeah. Here's here's what happens in a free marketplace. Can you freely turn it down? In a free marketplace. Yes, yes, you can free fuse it. No one everyone's always told you what you're gonna make before you actually start the job. Here's what happens. The reason you make sixteen dollars an hour is because your skill set in the marketplace only allows you to make sixteen dollars an hour. It's all about skill set. So so for a person that has this skill set, $16 an hour, shouldn't be saying, oh, the government is killing me and the, the rich man is keeping me down and I'm getting, uh, everybody's oppressing me and everybody's against me and uh, I don't have free will. Listen, you got free will. You got so much free will, you got so much free will, you can go get that $32 an hour job. You got it? And I'm going to tell you how you get a $32 an hour job. You can double your salary. You ready? You ready? How you going to double your salary? You get more skills. You bring more value to our marketplace. That's how you make more money. So you ask yourself, I'm making 16 bucks an hour. I'm miserable. I'm blaming the world about my problems, my lack of accountability. So what do I do? I find what jobs are paying $32 an hour and what skill sets are needed to get $32 an hour. And I go acquire those skills and I go get that job for three two dollars an hour, and I'm even happier. No longer is the rich man keeping me down, keeping me in handcuffs, keeping me a slave. This is how it works in a marketplace. You bring value, you get that value back in your pocket. There you go. There you go. <laughs> this is an exciting group. You guys got it. Thank you. <laughs> That's it, that's it. You live in it some dream world, Val. All right, let's thank our speaker for coming back. Always uh, giving us quite a bit of conversation here. Um, uh, Mr. Steele. Um, First of all, uh, Mr. Steele uh, gave us that old bit of libertarianism. I caught it there again. He, he peppered the entire presentation with these things. See, and I think Sid kind of was able to, to get, like, oh, if it's government, it doesn't work. Everything in the free, in the, in the capitalism works. Companies, every company is a success. All companies said, no, there's no such thing as a company that has failed or gone out of business. As a matter of fact, it's be very difficult to find any company that has existed for any significant number of years. Believe you me, most of them don't exist. They certainly don't exist in the same location or format from whence they began. There's tremendous turmoil, and if anything, free market capitalism, hey, when I think about it like evolution, it, it's, it's ruthless, the number of species that die off it was in the biological kingdom. It's just incredible. Uh, one other thing you got to keep in mind anytime you hear this, oh, let's, you know, the, the capitalist system is, is so much better and efficient than, than the public sector or the government operations. In 2006, while he was talking, I was thinking about how the Republicans made their latest effort to convert the money that is currently contained in the Social Security system, Service and turn it over to the private sector. They wanted to achieve this. Guess what? To take effect in 2008, 
when the stock market and the economy collapsed. You would have seen your pensions disappear had you listened to these individuals. So be cautious about, and you're talking about, the, we're the guy, these singers say, oh, don't listen to these guys who promise you a utopia. What I got here. Now the topic tonight was, oh, the impossibility of a revolution. And I kept scratching my head because I said, you know, I think there was one. Yeah. There was one in China. There was one in other countries. There was revolutions all over the place. I gave a lecture about a revolution. No, I gave a lecture on the American Revolution. And no doubt there was some guy in 1775, probably in the British Empire, who said why a revolution in the 13 colonies cannot succeed. <laughs> And they probably could have come up with all kinds of arguments. Now, what the capitalist wants you to believe is that a revolution will never succeed, so don't do anything except your station and <laughs> give them some crazy framework of how wealth is distributed like we just heard. And, you know, poverty is simply a matter of... Everyone is a poverty, is a, certainly it's poverty of choice. Not poverty of circumstances. You are poor because you chose to be poor. Didn't you realize that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and revolution change is impossible or change is dangerous. What they, the real danger was the capitalist said, hey, this guy wrote a book and he's telling people to stand up and be men and seize control of their situation and they can in fact change in society and in the world in their own station and and their own um, situation um, but anyhow and I'm sorry where did you get this stuff you just get this job what do you listen to this Republican like Rubio he said oh oh don't don't study things like philosophy you should become a welder because they get like twenty eight dollars you know, what, what kind of, when I heard that, at first I didn't, it became part of his standard speech. Is that what, don't become, a, just do things to make money. It's the marketplace. You know, don't, don't improve yourself as, our society doesn't look to improve people as individuals. And to say that our society doesn't, what do you need philosophers for? We just need welders. A welder is given higher priority than a philosopher. I go, not in the Republic of Plato. That was the perfect society. I guess he never read it, <laughs> but you know, people who think aren't valued, and people that like, like, what kind of job is welding? Like all day long? Do you know? Okay, this is, this is what you have to do to provide for your own. Get out of here! <laughs> all right, thanks a lot. Flip burgers instead, brother. Flip burgers. You ever try welding? Flip burgers. Flip burgers instead. I'd rather die than that. that works out for you. Yeah, th was the CEO do anything like welding? All right, Charlie, you're right. The revolution has happened. And it's called capitalism. Oh. Look what happened when China finally succeeded by, monet by monet modernizing under a capitalist system. Look what happened to the Soviet Union when they started their capitalistic reforms. Look at the rest of the world when they, with the fall of the Berlin Wall. The problem is, it's not, the problem is, is we haven't taken this capitalist revolution far enough. We haven't recognized property rights with the poor, where they can monetize their assets, start their businesses, and widen their networks of business opportunity. Hernando de Soto, in a book called The Mystery of Capital, tells us why capitalism succeeds in the West and not in the East. And his whole presumption is based upon the preponderance and respect of property rights, particularly those of the individuals, of corporations and companies, and of their ability to monetize those assets, to engage in business, and to widen their networks of opportunity. We do that in a sense now with globalization. 
But many people in these poor, undeveloped countries <coughs> don't have things such as clear property title, don't have such things as clear ownership of their business assets. It's all known throughout the community, and there's always what we call a black market or extra legal system that allows these people to survive, but because it's not legally recognized, they can't thrive. The real revolution that needs to take place is in one of law, in one of property rights, in one of good governance. I am not against government. I am for a functioning court system. I am for people being honest. I am for people making their way and trust developing. Even in this group, we do have some elements of mistrust. Somebody just walked out of here not paying a $12 check, uh -oh. Uh -oh. which means one of us is going to have to cover uh, that loss. So, you know, even with us, there's a still a little bit of a potential of fraud that comes in. Hmm. But there are things like insurance, there are things like bankruptcy laws that cover a lot of this stuff. And Charlie, to be honest with you, I would rather have the world ran by a bunch of capitalist gamblers than by any government committee ever created. All right. Why? Because those government gamblers, using government research, brought us things like the government internet, gamblers. brought us things like like the so new social media, brought us things like the computers, brought us things like fiber optic cables, which has definitely benefited and increased life. And furthermore, that system has brought another two-thirds of the people around the world out of poverty. The greatest poverty squashing engine in the world was the American capitalist system. Like Thank that. God it's a revolution, and I'm all for revolution American capitalism. And shit, that empire you want about America? You ever hear of Pax Americana? Well, I'm for it. Thank you very much. Yes, Pax Americana. You know, there was Pax Romana. And uh, well, what did Gibbons say about it? Uh, uh, they, they, uh, they made a desert and called it peace. Right. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, uh, while there were some virtues to Pax America, uh, Romana, uh, and there certainly have been uh, advances under Pax Americana. Uh, uh, nevertheless, the Filipinos uh, wanted their independence, and uh, they fought for it. And uh, they uh, finally convinced uh, the Americans uh, that uh, it, it was better that way, that Rebel they had their independence. Uh, and they don't want to go back uh, to being a part of Pax Americana. They, but they do need, they need some sort of support uh, in their, their, their world against uh, Chinese interests and uh, maybe Japanese interests and uh, the interests of Indonesia and of uh, uh, certain uh, militant minorities in Mindanao. Oh, well, there are all sorts of conspiracies and wars going on all the time. Class war is pretty universal day by day month by month, year by year, decade by decade, century by century. It goes on, and it is a basic social division in our world. And if you miscalculate it, if you are looking for a kind of world where people are a little more equal, a little more free, Free, equal, and fraternal, uh, that is, brotherly, sisterly, uh, more comradely, more concerned about 
the good and welfare of their neighbors and the world, then, then you want change. You want something of an end to the class war that goes on every day. And Marx had a, a way of looking, analysis, analysis uh, of what actually was going on and what was likely to go on and how to organize an opposition to it that would overcome the uh, problems and lead us to that liberty, equality, and fraternity that revolutionaries have been talking about, and he criticized the compromises of the Lasallians, who were leaders of uh, the German labor movement. Ferdinand Lasalle was the leader, of, uh, he called himself a Marxist, but Marx uh, told him that he wasn't, because he wanted to ally himself with Bismarck and the the Prussian elite, the Junkers, uh, against the, the 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 capitalists. The, Marx understood that capitalism, the capitalists, were for a certain kind of freedom. For capitalism, <laughs> for capitalists. Yes, they wanted for freedom, for, for wealth. Yes, and the Junkers were for freedom, for wealth, but you know they were the landed aristocracy. They weren't investing in capital, that is, so the means of production other than uh, farm production. Uh, so they. <laughs> Let us close this off. <laughs> Marx just wanted to put everything on the basis of a, a materialistic understanding of people's interests and how you were going to understand what kind of alliances and whose interests you right. wanted to represent. Right. I, think, I think that a lot of other people have an interest in speaking besides Brown. Yeah. Okay. okay. We oh, got time for Brown's speech. We got, we, it's getting to be 8.37, so we're going to have to kind of keep it clear to give Dave a little bit of a chance to rebut. So, you know, you know if you want to take your five minutes, go ahead. But if you okay. can brief it down a little bit, it would be appreciated. I'll do what I can. Thank you. <laughs> I would like to say the following. Um, we heard it said a few minutes ago that the speaker would prefer to take his chances with capitalist gamblers than uh, with government planners. Yeah. Actually, I think a certain amount of both is necessary. <laughs> On the one hand, if you have unbridled central planning, well, then you have Stalinism. But on the other hand, and also to some extent Nazism as well, since it must not be forgotten that while the capitalists put the Nazis into power, the Nazis ran away with it and pretty soon the capitalists were dancing to their tune and not the other way around. However, on the other hand, if you rely just on, on capitalist gamblers, well, then you have an unbridled setup similar to what you had, what you have now, and also what you had with the robber barons back at the end of the at the end of the 19th century, uh, in which miners, for example, labor under terrible conditions. If you lost your job in a mine, you also lost your house, and you got paid in scrip. And central planning not only ended these abuses, but it also brought about things like the Tennessee Valley Authority, which brought but not only water, but electric power to millions of people in the southeast who desperately needed it. Um, and, um, no, I think that's it. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you.
going to Moscow if you like it so much. Being an American and an American of Irish descent, I am hardly averse to the idea of rebellion or revolution. So with several people standing up here calling for revolution in several forms, uh, I was very simpatico. Uh, the fact of the matter is we have been seeing it. How many people around here have sat around over coffee or something stronger yearning for the days when comes the revolution? The fact of the matter is the revolution has been going on for at least the past 150 years. Not only here but in other countries. Social Security. We like to think of Social Security as something as American as apple pie. The fact of the matter is, it was invented by the very unlikely personage of Otto von Bismarck. Otto von Bismarck recognized the fact that unless he did something, and did something very, very definite, he was going to be saddled with a large number of indigent elderly people uh, in a Germany that he was trying to modernize. Um, Two of my favorite American revolutionaries are Teddy Roosevelt and his distant cousin Franklin Roosevelt. <coughs> now Franklin Roosevelt, with a stroke of a pen, completely changed the class structure in the United States when, for example, he brought Social Security against the wishes of a large number of the power elite in this country. Uh, when he brought that to the American people, um, when uh, he was starting to give uh, aid to dis, uh, you know, farmers right. having great difficulties during the Depression, that was considered quite radical. Because remember, we were the country of laissez-faire. And if you were a farmer and you were starving to death, that was your own fault. Yes. And you were expected to go to Oklahoma or go to California or whatever and go pick grapes. <coughs> that changed the landscape. Another guy who was a great American revolutionary, in my opinion, was Harry S. Truman, yeah. who gave us the GI Bill. Yep. Yeah. Now, the GI Bill, with a stroke of a pen, strengthened the middle class in this country in ways you can only imagine. Guys who went into the service in World War II, barely able to read and write, <coughs> came out, were given the opportunity to go to college, some of them became lawyers, some became doctors, some became engineers, some got a lot of very, very solid jobs on the strength of the education that they were able to get through the GI Bill. Yep. It created a whole strong middle class. Amen. A middle class Amen. that remained vibrant until the last few years. So, you know, we don't need to throw stones at capitalism as an institution, and at the same time, we don't need to throw stones at anyone who advocates helping uh, the people who need help, because quite frankly, we're all in the same boat together. Now, whether that boat is the Titanic or whether it is the Queen Mary is up to us to decide. We're at a crossroads in our history. We're hearing an awful lot of rhetoric coming from a number of political candidates who would love to be president. Some of them have about the same qualifications that I would have to be Archbishop of Chicago. <laughs> Trust me, you don't want that to happen. <laughs> I would not make a good one. But the fact of the matter is, we are, we are at this crossroads. We could, in the future, in the very near future, see an America we could only dream of not too many years ago, or we could be in for a major nightmare and you know who the players are, you know who to vote for, and I have just been told. <laughs> okay, David, all right. Ramsey Stirl, the last who, else, who, else, who else wants to give a rebuttal speech? Don, we don't have time. Wait, wait, no, you're, you're, you're mistaken, Tim. We do have more time. Now, who else wants to give a rebuttal speech? Okay, nobody else? Okay, well, I will give a rebuttal speech. And so, uh, now, first of all, 
First of all, I would like to, I don't know if, Ms. if Mr. Steele is here or not. Yes, he's there. All right. Well, I would like to just, I would like to uh, thank Mr. Steele for coming. And here, let's here. have a round of applause Yay! for him for coming to speak here. Now, um, I, uh, I actually learned a lot from this lecture tonight. I was, he had a lot of information and, um, and, and, and it was very interesting. I, um, however, there are certain um, it's, it's talk about the history of Marxism. It, it, you know, I've never considered myself a Marxist, but actually after listening to him talking about Marxism, I became more sympathetic to Marxism <laughs> as a result. Uh, now, I just want to say though, and to socialism, um, which I've never really considered myself a socialist either. However, I've noticed that Mr. Steele has a, a rather peculiar definition of socialism. In other, he's saying here that not all who call themselves socialists are really socialists. Uh, I've always felt that if you call yourself a socialist, you are one. But uh, and and so, but but so. This is what's known in, in logical theory as victory by definition. It's a, you know where you say where you, you define a word that your way. You say communism cannot help but work. Well, well, well look, at the, look at Russia, it didn't work out there. Well, that's, that wasn't real communism. That's, that's how you do that. Now, uh, some other points. There are some things that he, that Mr. Steele got, that in my opinion, I think he was wrong about. Well, he was right according to his own definition. He said there was no socialism in the US. Well, I mean, we, had, we, had, we did have a socialist party in this country. We had Eugene Debs. Oh, by the way, Tim, could you turn the, the monitor around so that I can see how much time I have left, please? Well, the problem is now you're cutting into Mr. Oh. Steele's time, and uh, okay. we're going to have to. Okay. No. Get well, out of well wait a second. We got it, the the restaurant closes at nine, and and, and we look, I know out. you'd rather hear hear him talk than me, but thirteen but, more uh, minutes. Be out of your right yeah. Now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's only it's only eight forty six. Finish. Okay. Now, but there there was a, there uh, was and actually still is a socialist party in the U S. You've had Eugene Debs, Norman Thomas, and now we got Bernie Sanders the second most popular Democrat, and he's a socialist. He's a democratic socialist. So, uh, so I would say that actually the United States does, as a matter of, um, the United States does have a socialist uh, movement and has had since the 19th century. The Haymarket Martyrs called themselves socialists, by the way. Now, um, now, Mr. Steele also says that trusts were just a passing phase. Um, actually, the trust, at least here in the United States, stopped only with the advent of trust busting, the Sherman Antitrust Act, and then the actual enforcement of it by, by Teddy Roosevelt. Exactly. Now, um, and, and by the way, it's coming back because we see how in, cap, in, 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 in the free market system, the big fish eat the little ones, the small companies go out of business, and the big ones take over the market. Uh, we see it happening now. Now, another thing that he, Mr. Steele said is that there is no tendency for companies to get bigger and bigger without government help. If you look at what actually happens to certain businesses, that's obviously not true. Um, he also said, now, he, he also said there's no class conflict, but he said something that contradicts that. He said society cannot exist without what he calls officials, uh, people running things. And, and he also said that their interests are going to inevitably be contrary to those of the masses. Well, if the majority, if 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 the rulers, of, if every society has rulers, and the rulers' interests are always co going to be contrary to the wishes of the majority, then there's a conflict between the wishes of the rulers and the wishes of the majority, according to that definition. Now, I also, he also said that the Bolsheviks set Russia back a hundred years. I guess that's speculation about what would have happened if they hadn't taken over, because in fact. Uh, Russia became an industrialized country and got its own, even its own space program yeah. under the Bolsheviks. Uh, I'm not saying I'm pro-Bolshevik, but they did it. Now, um, now, Mr. Steele also described intellectuals in the U.S. as America's ruling class. However, those guys in the think tanks and such and are generally employees either of the government or of private business. So they work for someone else. Who are their bosses are, well, the, if you get, if you go up to, if it's government, the bosses are the politicians. But the politicians are also paid for by who? The rich. So the real ruling class of this country is the rich. Now, um, I also now as for this idea that that improvements to the workers' conditions under capitalism are inevitable, it's not true. Uh, it only happens some of the time. Generally, it happens because of either unions, uh, government edict like with Bismarck, 
or because uh, companies see what's going on elsewhere and they try to dissuade the workers from okay. the unions by, right. by making things nicer. And I guess my time is uh, well done. Your time's up, Don. Okay, so my time is up. And so, uh, all right, let's I'll yield the yeah. floor to our speaker. Mr. Uh, Mr. Steele, the final remarks, please. So let's have a round of applause for him again. Don't go easy on us. We want to hear the truth. Come on. <laughs> Please keep it on the clock. <laughs> well, thank you very much for those um, provocative comments. Uh, m many of them uh, I didn't really disagree with, so um, m many people uh, thought that they were differing with me when they really weren't. But I'll pick up a few things. Um, let me see. Okay. Um, just to clarify something conceptually, uh, somebody talked about concentration and referred to rich and poor. Uh, there are two different issues. There's the issue of the, how rich the rich are in relation to the poor, but the, and, the, and the question of how big business firms are. I mean, you could have millions of little companies all owned by one person, or you could have uh, a few very huge companies with lots of people owning stock in those companies. Um, so these are independent, uh, the question of... Uh, of uh, and what I was talking about was not rich and poor, or that's an interesting question. I did talk about that about a year ago here. Uh, I, was just, I was talking about Marx's theory that business enterprises have to get bigger and bigger, and not just bigger in absolute terms, but bigger in relative terms. Um, and that has been falsified by history. I mean, uh, the... Um, the uh, share of total assets controlled by the top 50 companies in the U.S. or the top 200 companies and so on has declined up, uh, since the Second World War. So there isn't, there isn't any uh, sign there of, um, of uh, an inc increasing con concentration. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's, not a, it's one of the ways in which society has evolved differently uh, to what Marx expected. Um, somebody talked about imperialism and thought I would disagree, but I don't disagree about that. I'm opposed to imperialism, and I don't, I'm not in favor of um, the uh, interventionist foreign policy of the United States. So, you know, that, and it didn't touch upon anything I'd said either. Um, and uh, somebody also said something about office workers being proletarianized. And I don't necessarily disagree with that. Uh, my point was not that... Marx was wrong about the economic classification of office workers. My point was that he predicted that uh, the whole working class would come to think of itself <coughs> subjectively uh, as having common interests, and I don't think that has happened. I don't think that the proletarianized office workers think of themselves as being uh, in the same group as the proletarianized uh, blue-collar workers. Um, <coughs> now, um, Charlie uh, was a little bit incoherent here and there, but um, uh, he did. One, th one thing I caught was that he seemed to think it was a problem with capitalism that um, companies keep going out of business. Well, I think it's a good thing that companies keep going out of business because they fail, so they go out of business. Uh, and I wish that governments, when government departments and government programs, when they fail, they go out of business. But of course, it doesn't work like that. Um, now, I, I, I did, have not said there won't be revolutions, and there aren't revolutions. So revolutions go on all the time, and of course I'm well aware of that. I was just talking about Marx's idea of revolution, uh, and um, that uh, it, it never happened, uh, and uh, it's never going to happen for the reasons that I, that I gave. Now, if we're talking about um, the meaning of socialism, I, I don't want to lay down how people use the meanings of words. I mean, that people can use words any way they like. Bernie Sanders calls himself a socialist, and that's fine. Uh, the, I've listened to a few of his speeches. Uh, he spoke about, he, 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 he gave Denmark as an, an example uh, of uh, a socialist country, and I think it's very clear that Denmark is a capitalist country and not a socialist country. Anyway, I'm receiving signals that I must uh, shut up, so I'm going to do so. Thank you very much. Okay, close us out. Close us out, Don.